Welcome to the first annual Women in Cyber Education panel presented by International, um, FCA International and sponsored by Sienna and Walker. Um, please, uh, everybody silence your phones. And uh, I'm uh, pleased to introduce Linda Newton as the moderator for the panel. Linda is currently serving on the uh, board of uh, directors for FCA Hawaii Educational Foundation. She's currently the treasurer, and next year she'll be assuming the position of the chair. Uh, she retired two years ago as the CIO and executive director for the C4I for the Pacific Fleet, where she served in that capacity for 12 years. Linda has over 32 years as a federal civilian for the Navy and 18 years as a senior uh, executive service member. She holds a bachelor and a master's degree and a graduate certificate from the Navy War College and she's a survivor of numerous uh, executive um, educational programs. <laughs> Linda is passionate about mentoring people, men, women, at any level. Uh, of the, their career, and uh, you can ask her about that more. Uh, but I'm mostly honored to introduce Linda because her and I have been friends for over 20 years, and an interesting fact that a lot of people don't know about Linda is she has a beautiful singing voice, and she sang at my wedding with Mo Keali, if any of you are local and know Mo Keali, so Mo Keali was her backup band. Thank you. Uh, that's Joy Hess. She's currently the chairperson of the FCA Hawaii Educational Foundation and has been serving in that capacity for three years. And we're going to be lucky because she's agreed to stay on the board and continue to work with us. So again, aloha. So this is the first panel out here, sponsored by FCA International, Siena, and Walker and & Associates. So I wanted to, to thank those organizations for sponsoring the panel and the reception today. <laughs> the theme of this panel is the role of education in developing and retaining current and future technologists. But I expect you'll hear broader comments than just this theme from the panelists. And I hope we have an engaged discussion this afternoon. So please take full advantage of the talent and experience we have here today. These panelists are all very well-educated, professionally accomplished, and strong leaders, and they are women. We are lucky to have them join us for this inaugural Women in AFSEA event in Hawaii. There have been other Women in AFSEA events at other chapters around the world. This is our first one here, and we sincerely hope that it won't be the last. We are going to start out with a video from an interview with Karen Sandler, who is the executive director for the Software Freedom Conservancy. And that organization helps promote, improve, develop, and defend free, libre, and open source software, or as they call it, FLOSS, projects. Please play the video. Somebody licked my neck. Um, I've been hit on within five minutes of entering a present, like a inter entering the conference venue. When checking in as a speaker, it's been assumed that I was an assistant or a spouse. I'm the executive director of one of the most important organizations in free and open source software now. And when I'm hanging out with another executive director of a similarly situated organization who's a man, when a technical issue comes up, everyone tries to explain it to me, but not to him. It's so much worse than I ever thought it was. There's this thing called imposter syndrome that a lot of women in tech have. It's the idea that you will be discovered as an imposter, that uh, you're fake, that at the end of the day, you don't know that much, and you will be exposed as the, the fraud that you are. Women in tech often have it because there aren't the same kind of role models. And women who have imposter syndrome are much less likely to hold themselves out as experts. So for example, I was interviewed for a documentary called Patent Absurdity about software patents. 
And the director asked me if, um, you know, basically contacted me and asked me if I would do an interview. And I said, oh, no, 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 you don't need to interview me. Here are all the really big names that you should interview. Um, you know, and I worked with two of them and I recommended that they set up interviews. When he was finished interviewing them, he came into my office and he said, can I talk to you for a minute? I was like, sure. He shut the door and I was like, this is weird. And he sat down and he said, you know, every woman who's been recommended to me for this documentary has turned it down and has, has said exactly what you did and has suggested men as experts, but multiple people have recommended you as an expert in this field. Why are you deflecting this? Can you please help me? Because this has happened with every single woman I have contacted. And I can't publish this documentary with only men knowing that there are women who are experts in the field. And it was just such an eye-opening moment for me because I was afraid to hold myself out as an expert in case I said something stupid. But knowing that people who are very advanced in their career, knowing that people who are impressive also have imposter syndrome helps a lot. If women don't see other women or if underrepresented groups and minorities don't see people who look like them as experts, then we internalize the message that this field isn't for us, but we need to reevaluate this whole culture because we are just inadvertently excluding a lot of people who will benefit not just our technology, but also our society. Thank you. I recall that 20 years ago, after I was sele as selected as a senior executive service member, my boss, Admiral Archie Clemens, a four-star admiral who was the commander of the Pacific Fleet at the time, told me that I would face unique challenges since I wasn't a 50-year-old white male. I believe it's important and imperative for current and future technologists to have role models and mentors. There are a growing number of female role models and mentors up here, in the room, and in the IT, cyber, and STEM fields. You know them, you develop them, you are them. We're going to talk today about education. Education is extremely important for IT, cyber, and STEM. I've asked the panelists to talk about three areas. Their experiences as women and experts in their field, why education is important, and how we should educate current and future technologists, and how we should develop and retain those current and future technologists. You'll hear today from different perspectives, industry, academia, military, and government. I will introduce each panelist and ask them to make their remarks. I will then start off with a few questions to get the conversation going. We are not using the ask TNAP question email address today. There's an old school of a mic um, there in the middle of the room and I have a whole list of questions, so if we don't get questions from the floor, we'll do that, or if somebody says they don't want to have any more questions, then we'll start the reception. So I do want to note that for the reception, which will be held in back, uh, there's a drawing that's, going to, that's sponsored by Walker & Associates for a Nike ID, completely customizable pair of shoes. Mm -hmm. So if you drop your business card, or if you don't have a business card, there's some extra ones there. If you write your name and your cell phone number on the back, there will be a drawing during the, the reception. So we're gonna start off with Cindy Moran. Cindy Moran is currently the president and managing par partner of Pikes Way Peak LLC. She has over 30 years as a federal government civilian. She has 11 years as a senior executive service member nine years as the director of the network operations at Defense Information Systems Agency, or DISA. She holds a bachelor in information systems and a graduate certificate in information security management. And I also asked the panelists to give me a fun fact because I think it's neat that we talk a little bit about who we are. So she says she's the only panel member that has served at every GS level from a GS2 to an SES2, and we found out in our prep session beforehand that that is true. So please welcome Cindy Moran. Thank 
you very much. It's, a, it's an honor to be here, and I, I enjoy this show and come back every year, so I, I do appreciate being able to participate. So to, to start with some of the personal experiences that, that I've had, which are, are slightly different. So the, the GS2 to SES2 is, is very true. I downgraded from a GS9 to a GS2 temp position. It was the best career move I ever made. It was the hardest day of my life when I walked out of that hiring personnel office because the only job they could give me was a temporary GS2. It was also the day that I got my TSSCI, which opened doors for me across the rest of the board and learning about some of the things while I worked in the SACIRS front office in Belgium was for 90 days was a really superb opportunity. But the day that I had to take that backward step in my mind, was a tough day for me, it was a tough decision. But lots of reasons required that that happen, a hiring freeze and continuing resolution as we all know how money works was a big part of that. But I think the difference for me with that is what I made of the opportunity, even though at the time I didn't think it was an opportunity. And so I ended up um, lots of different jobs, very technical, and I was in those technical jobs because I wanted to be technical. The reason I became an executive, which is, is quite interesting, is I got tired of people telling me what to do without having a voice at the table. And so it wasn't about power or money or anything else. It was about wanting to change and influence things that I had worked on and was very passionate about. And I was lucky enough to have those opportunities. The other thing that um, just about me personally is when Linda talked about my undergraduate degree, it's an infor information systems degree. When I first got into technology, I was trying to get a library of science degree, and so the math, the computing, the programming, all the technology was there. And after three years of calculus and all the upper level math, I said, why do I wanna be a librarian? Let's do something more technical with this. And, and that gets into some of the why education's important, but why it doesn't necessarily have to be traditional education. Ooh, I did not touch anything, <laughs> just, just saying. Um, yeah, so, um, so yeah, lots of women get into tech from lots of different angles and lots of different directions. And I guess my, my point here would be, if you are a woman in this field and you get into it like I did from library science or a different direction, there's no less math, there's no less technology. It's what you do with it and the jobs you go after and how you take that experience. Now my second degree is actually from a school of engineering and I don't know if it's harder or easier, it was different. Um, but um, the math was still important, the science was still important and then the leadership in the environment was important. For future technologists, I think it, this is not just a male female question but everybody. We need to really work on continuing education and certifications and staying current and, and how you do what you're passionate about because our, our industry moves so quickly that if you're not continuing your education, whether it's through reading um, sessions like this, the continuing education credits, whatever it may be, you've got to stay current or you become stale. I think women tend to be a little bit more um, I, I want to say flexible about, about doing those things and wanting to, they may be more, more driven. Men tend to learn more on the job. It's, it's a different mentality about how you learn, but all of us need to stay current in, in what we do. And that's one of the, the beauties of, of coming to shows like this. One of the other things with technology and the future that I, I truly, truly believe as we look at certifications and who's doing what, and you see this on the, the industry side today, a lot more than you do on the government side, although the government's got a huge program to do this, is we're getting back into the realm of, um, I would call vocational technical. So you go out of high school and instead of going after a traditional four-year degree, because not everybody wants to be a computer engineer, maybe you just want to be the best computer technician or the best cyber technician or the best web programmer, you can do different kinds of education to get you into the same, still requires math, still technology, it's still in the same area, 
but it's not necessarily the traditional four-year college degree that I had to have when, when I made this transition. So I think we need to start thinking as we're talking to our younger people coming forward about college is a great foundation and education is a huge foundation, but if you really wanna jump into the technological side and you're going into a career where being the best web designer in the world is what you wanna do and you don't need a college education to do that. Maybe it's a two year degree instead of a four year degree and it's a technical degree. That's not a bad thing. I mean, we built our country on that early on. Not everybody went to college. There were a lot of folks who were just tremendous technicians and people who worked on assembly lines, they were still engineers, but it was a different kind of a degree in it. So I think as we move forward, we're gonna see a lot more of that in this particular field because of cyber and, and where it's going. Not everybody needs to build the computer. Some people need to operate it and secure it and maintain it. Thank you. So next we have Ms. Jody Ito. Okay. She's currently the CIO of the University of Hawaii and has been since 2000. She's been with the University of Hawaii for over 35 years. And her bachelor and master's degrees in computer and information science is also from University of Hawaii. I sense a theme here. <laughs> the other thing which I thought was interesting is uh, she's a member of EDUCAUSE, which is a nonprofit association whose mission is to advance higher education through the use of information technology. And the fun fact she shared with us is she describes herself as a closet foodie, that she loves wine and food in that order. <laughs> so, Ms. Ito. So thank you very much for that introduction, um, kind introduction. So um, yes, wine first, food second. I have Chief Information Security Officer for the University of Hawaii. My job is to protect the information assets of the university. And we're highly decentralized. I have no idea where the data is, where our sensitive data is. I have no idea who's out there holding it or, or how, pe how people are protecting it. So that's why I drink. So, <laughs> so in, in fact, I was a little bit late coming here today because we are addressing a security incident at the University of Hawaii. We have a lot of adversaries out there. Um, not just your traditional cyber criminals who are after your IDs to make money off of your credit cards, but the types of adversaries that are really persistent, um, hostile nation states. And that's actually one we're dealing with right now. So um, I need technologists. So we talk about education and how do we bring the technologists up into this field. And as Cindy talked about, it's about making sure that people one, understand the careers that are out there, and how can we get our youth involved at a very early age. Um, so I came up through the traditional path. As you heard, I have a bachelor's and master's in computer sciences, um, but largely I, I got into computer sciences because I didn't want to go through another semester of calculus. So it, I started down the engineering path, and then the math got, I went, eh, I don't think so. So computer science was one less semester of calculus. Uh, but I enjoyed programming, and at that time, uh, when I was in, in college, there was actually a balance of male and females in computer sciences, and um, not so much in engineering, and I don't know where that changed. So as we talk about females being in this role, in leadership roles, for me, um, always having been a computer science, dealing with network engineers and systems administrators, they were largely male-dominated fields. Um, and I had the good fortune of being with the university since I graduated from college. So that was like 10 years ago, just saying. Um, but it, it's afforded me a great opportunity because I think in the academic field, um, it's a little bit more balanced. We're not in the traditional corporate um, environment and really women have an opportunity to advance without the traditional, um, I think, perceptions of how women are in leadership roles. And I, I was also very fortunate that I had very supportive bosses who actually were all male. So I believe that, and I'm gonna totally butcher a Seinfeld quote, but, and the Seinfeld quote, well, it's not a lie if you believe it, but for me is, if you believe it, it must be true. So if we as females just believe in ourselves 
and we um, embrace what we do and have confidence in what we do. And then we can actually make great strides forward. Uh, so I think growing up, and I'm saying growing up through the university environment, uh, one of the things I learned early on is really don't try to waste your energy changing somebody else's opinion of you. They're always gonna have that opinion of you, no matter what. So just do your own thing and make sure that what you do is uh, supporting your beliefs and all of the things that you hold dear and cherish into your core. And that's how we can then move forward. So for me, it's been an interesting challenge again because I was born and raised in Hawaii. I'm an Asian female. Uh, we actually weren't, I think, exposed early on to leadership roles. Like being up here, sitting in front of all of you is a terrifying experience. And this has always been the case for me. So one of the things I promised myself is to get better at it, is to kind of accept the roles when offered. And then I get to grow. And, and thank you to all of you for dealing with me and helping me grow. Uh, because we, we have to extend ourselves and challenge ourselves just to, to become a better version of ourselves. Now moving on to how do we create the technologists, the future technologists, it is about mentorship. It is about getting out there in the community and engaging our youth. So in fact, on, on Saturday, um, we're gonna be working, or working, we're gonna be uh, mentoring Girl Scouts. So as part of their STEM Fest conference, which is a half day, and one of the things I coordinated for the University of Hawaii with partners like Claire's Help, <laughs> and NSA and FBI, um, and some of our programmers, female programmers, we're gonna hold a cyber zone so that we can introduce a whole bunch of young girls to uh, careers in science, technology, engineering, and math. And again, letting them know that these jobs are out there, they're well-paying jobs, and that we as women and as professionals, how do we support them and to encourage them to continue in this path. The things that Cindy touched on that was really close to my heart is how do we ensure that there are the non-traditional pathways into technology? And that is one of the things we're working at the university is, is very key for us is how can we graduate high school students such that they have 15 or 30 credits towards a university degree already in this area of technology? And if we can graduate them from high school with the industry certifications, are we then able to help them into the workforce right away if that's what they want to do? So, um, so as part of something with the University of Hawaii, the system, we're looking at all of the campuses and all of the programs related to cyber, and how do we ensure that the programs are uh, aligned from the two year to the four year, but also from the high school into college, but also into industry, if that's where the students want to go initially. So there shouldn't be a standard pathway. You know, you've got to go to high school, graduate, get into a four year college. You should have many, many alternatives to how you get to your profession. And so one of the other things I'm really interested in is, is for the incumbent worker. If you do not already have a degree, how can we uh, um, align your experiences to give you university credits so that you can then apply it to a four-year degree? So I think there's a number of things that we need to do as technologists, as academics, but also working with industry. How can we get industry to change the requirements in their job descriptions? So right now, working with the uh, Chief Information Officer Council, the CIO Council here in Hawaii, one of the things they have is you must have a four-year degree or a cyber or a technology-related job. That should not be. How do we change that? So we're having all of these discussions now, and I look forward to having your assistance in, in helping us move this effort forward. So thank you. So the next panelist is... Oh is Colonel Claire Puccio. She currently serves as the Chief of Staff of the Army 311th Signal Command for the Pacific Theater. <clears throat> Excuse me. She was commissioned in the Army 28 years ago as a signal officer. She is a Congressional Fellow in 2005. 
She recently returned from Afghanistan as the congressional liaison for the commanding general, Resolute Support, U.S. Forces Afghanistan. She holds a Bachelor's of Science in Computer Science, several master's degrees, and a PhD in Science and Technology Studies. She is a postdoctorate fellow in cybersecurity, and her fun fact that she shared is she started a Sisters in Arms mentoring program in Afghanistan that is still going strong, and she's planning on starting one here in Oahu. Colonel Cuccio. Thank you for that in introduction. Um, the first thing I'd like to talk about is the, the Army as a whole. So the Army values, when I first saw the topic of this panel, I, I just was sitting back and reflecting on how the Army views education. So the Army overall views, takes education very seriously. And when I graduated the War College, I had been in the Army 22 years, and I had spent, at that, up to that point, four and a half years in school. So I was thinking to myself, you know, what other profession sends you to school? You know, every few years, every five or so years, the Army sends you back and brings you back and brings you to a higher level of education. So I think that, I don't know how we, I don't know, I, I guess I don't have a lot of industry experience myself, so I don't know how industry deals with that. I mean, I would imagine you go back to the university and you go through training courses, little training courses, but, but what the Army does, I was hoping there'd be more, more uh, young FCNs here, but I see most of the younger people are, are already in the uniform, so they've already, they've already figured out that secret to the Army that you can, you can get educated and not pay a dime. So, but, so when I, when, and one of the things that Jody brought up was why computer science? So I was also a computer science major, and back when I went to school, you know, there, there really wasn't that much in the way of computers. And I just remember my father fighting with my sister who wanted to be an art major. And he would tell her, you're never gonna be able to get a job. And you know, computers is the wave of the future and you have to be part of it. And so, and you know, 17 year old Claire Cuccio had nothing better to do. So I, I didn't wanna get yelled at. So I just figured, well, <laughs> let me go into computer science. And it turned out to be one of the most incredible things that I've done because then I went into the Army Signal Corps and when I first came in, the wall was still up in Germany. The, there was no internet, no smartphones. <coughs> I know Lieutenant Merrick's horrified right now. <laughs> but it's, it's really interesting talking to her about, about what it was like you know, back in the day when I first came in. But I got to experience this throughout my career, was the advent of the internet and how, you know, the satellites, you know, we had little, the PSC-5s and they, they just weren't, the capabilities of what we can do in, com in computer science today is, is absolutely incredible. And I just feel like my whole life and my whole adult life has spanned this, this incredible, I've experienced it personally mm -hmm. through the Army, and I just, I just think it's incredible. So, as far as how important education is, so one of the things that you have to do when you enter a program where there, where there is no program, or as stuff develops, you have to self-study. So, these days, you know, my, my first go-to when I self-study is I look over to my husband and say, hey, do you know what this is? If I hear a, if I hear a term, I don't know. But then I, I go and look it up and I say, you know, I really, I need to know more about this because people that work for me expect me to know what I'm talking about. <laughs> and if you don't self-study, then you just, you just get left behind. I mean, technology is moving so fast and it's still moving fast. And if you don't take the time to read the articles and go to the conferences and talk to people that, that, you, that have the knowledge, that have already educated themselves on whatever it is you're trying to look at, then it's, you, you'll, just, you'll get left behind so quickly. So in that vein, my second point is to find a mentor but, I mean, everybody needs a mentor, but you also need to find people that, 
people that have something that you lack. Because if you associate yourself with that, you'll, you'll assimilate it. I mean, it, it's, really, it's really incredible. Because I look at, there's so many wonderful people that I've worked for in the past that I've seen at this conference today. And I, I just, I've been reflecting about it all day. Just, you know, you take a little piece from every person. And it, it's really helpful. And then as a woman in the Pacific, right now, I mean, it's a great place to be. The 311 Signal Command, there's more women in power positions than in any unit I've ever been in. So I was really happy to see that. You know, I have a, I have a boss that you don't really know because he treats everyone the same. So there's no, you just really, it's, it's not like some of the army units I've been in. So it's a very wonderful environment. And then usually back in my career in the younger days, I would go to meetings and I'm the only woman there. And today, every time I go to a meeting, Mie's there. So <laughs> she, <laughs> she's in every meeting I go to. So it's, you know, I'm never alone. It's really nice. And then I recently met Jody because we, the unit is trying to support some things that University of Hawaii is doing, but then we're going to collaborate on some things in the future. And it's just, it's just really nice to have other women that are, that have the same background as you do, that are in the STEM fields. So that's my third point, is to build your network. And when you, when you find these other people, you know, bring them into your circle, do things with them, and get to know them because they've, Everybody has had the, the same kind of experiences coming up, mm -hmm. and it's a lot easier if you have someone else to talk about it with. So those are my three points. Self-study, find a mentor, and build your network around you. Thank you, Colonel. The next panelist is... <laughs> the next panelist is Ms. Miyi Chung. She is currently the division chief Capability Delivery Division for the Defense Information Systems Agency, Pacific, DISAPAC. She holds a bachelor's and master's degree in electrical engineering. She was a Naval Research Laboratory Edison Fellow. She has started a PhD in computer science. She holds two patents. And her fun fact, which I thought was quite interesting, is she was a high school dropout. So with that, Ms. Miyi Chung. Thank you. Um, it's a great honor to be part of this panel with a very distinguished women in uh, leadership position. Um, as Linda stated, yes, I am a high school dropout, not because you know, I was doing the wrong things, but I wanted to advance myself um, to become a, a better contributor to the society. That's what I was thinking when I was 16. Um, and with that, I was fortunate enough to enroll in college. Um, so I graduated from University of Maryland College Park. My dream was to work for Naval Research Laboratory. Um, it's because they were doing a lot of great, fascinating research and they were leading a lot of the, the cutting edge technology. And I was so flattered when I, gra when I was graduating from uh, college that they sent me a postcard wanting to interview me. So I went and I interviewed and I got the job. And then it was another great opportunity with the government where they actually paid for me to go to George Washington University to get my master's degree. They allowed me to study two days. Uh, I don't have to report to work. Uh, I, I was able to study two days and then work three days. Of course, I had to pay back, you know, obl obligatory three years after that, but it was a, such a sweet deal. And then uh, when I went down to Naval Research Laboratory Detachment down in Mississippi, they wanted me to pursue a PhD. So I started my PhD. Um, it was great because I had my advisor working for me, so I knew it was a shoe-in, um, except <laughs> family was more important to me, so I had to follow my husband to Korea, and uh, I, I gave up pursuing my PhD. Nevertheless, uh, I 
found a job with uh, Defense Information System Agency. Now, when I was working at NRL, that was completely research and development. And so we had a lot of other females who were computer programmers. Uh, it was very much of a civilian sector, so um, you know, we were doing really great as a team. Now, me, Chung, in an operational environment in Korea, that was very, very challenging for me. When I went to the meetings, I'm the only female in the room, as uh, Claire indicated. Every meeting, every kind of discussion, whether it's at AO level or even at the 06 level, it was, I was the only female in the room. And I was the only DISA person in that room as well, surrounded by a lot of Army folks. So Army trained me well, I think. <laughs> But that also made me think about, you know, am I really contributing to what I started out as a 16-year-old who wanted to pursue something higher than just becoming a regular, average person? We have a really challenge, I believe, because right now, as part of this APAC, I lead a group of great engineers. My division, we do a lot of the engineering work for the Pacific Theater. We are responsible for all the transport, um, all the um, IP network for the DOD. I have about uh, a 24 uh, military and civilian personnel. And out of the 24, about a quarter of them are females. So I'm very blessed to have a lot of females in my division. When I became division chief at DISAPAC, I was told that I am the first female within DISAPAC as a GS-15 in that leadership role. So that challenged me. How do I make myself a value add to the agency that I love, which is DISA, because of the mission that they have? And as I was asked to be part of this panel, I was actually thinking about what is it that I have to offer to anybody to collaborate in terms of enticing, luring a lot of the young people into this STEM field. So I decided to be corny and use the same STEM as a acrostic to come up with what I believe is the way that we need to develop and retain workforce, whether it is people who are young as well as the current workforce. So the first uh, um, letter, S, I think we need to seek out comp competent STEM candidates starting from or even before kindergarten. Today, the millennials are two-year-olds are holding on to their tablets, their parents' smartphones, and they're actually playing with it. But do they really understand the importance of cybersecurity? Do they really understand how that device came to be? It is part of their livelihood and their lifestyle today, but do they understand what they have in front of them took some engineers, some computer programmers, some mathematicians to deliver that capability to them? And I think we need to start training them by seeking out those young um, students when they are in as, as, as early as in middle school, if not even earlier. Because to me, STEM is a mindset, and me as a female, you know, when we're younger, we, we ladies, females tend to play by having, playing with dolls or playing a kitchen. Vice, boys play with Legos. They start breaking things, and they start building them up. So to me, it's really about a, a mindset. We as parents need to make sure that we train up our kids when they're young so that they can think about math, so that they can think about engineering, so that they can think about building the Lego blocks together and do something. And then the next uh, letter is T. As we're seeking out these competent um, potential STEM workforce for tomorrow, we also need to teach the value of contributing to the national security and impacting the livelihood of the next generation. Me working for DOD, and the reason why I wanted to work at NRL is because I knew that it was NRL who invented radar. And then the internet that we are using today that everybody, the entire world depends on, started out with DARPA, which is the DOD, Defense Research 
and Advancement uh, Re uh, Project Agency, microwave that we use to cook our pizza today, and GPS, um, weather forecast, J57 jet engine and pressure pressurized cabin that we all live in when we fly in the commercial airline. Those are all inventions that started with DOD. My son just graduated from Virginia Tech and he started to work at Qualcomm. They offered them six digit figure as a salary for an entry level engineer. For government employees, that is unheard of. If you're lucky if you have $50,000 salary as an entry level engineer. There's no way that we, the government, can compete with the private sector. Mm -hmm. So the only way that we need to instill in the young potential government workforce is to, in, to let them understand the value of what you do today that can impact next generation. Just like 45 years ago, DARPA started internet project, which we live and depend on today, commerce. Every you know, social life that, that we deal with, SNS, it's all on the internet. So we need to instill in our young people that what you do today, it's not all about just money and financial gain, but it is impacting and contributing to the national security and for a good livelihood, a very affluent country of USA that our children and our grandchildren will live in. The next letter is E. Um, not, not only do we need to seek out the, the next generation STEM candidates and teach them about the great value of being civil servant, but we need to continue to engage and encourage throughout the educational process. I was fascinated when I went to the STEM innovation uh, room upstairs when you have, when you have these um, seven-year-old, I mean seventh grader, who was telling me about the robotic project. And he was telling me about a state map that he, uh, he was using to, to create and develop this ro robotic uh, equipment. I was fascinated because I was thinking, what was I doing when I was in seventh grade? I wasn't thinking about programming. I was not definitely thinking about building robotics. But it starts by encouraging these young ones to get involved in a lot of the STEM programs that DOD has. Navy has a lot of the STEM projects, starting with the summer camp. They have a lot of internship. We have a lot of scholarship. FCA gives a lot of scholarships to um, STEM students. So we need to start engaging and encouraging a lot of the, the young people, even at college level. We need to encourage them to become part of the, the summer intern program that the government has to offer. And even for the current uh, federal government, just like the way that I was able to take advantage of NRL paying for my tuition, DISA also invested in me where they sent me to CIO school with uh, uh, McNair, NDU, National Defense University, so I got my CIO there. They also invested in me in terms of sending me to executive leadership development programs. They sent me to many national strategic programs. So there are many ways that we can continue to encourage and engage a lot of these training programs that are out there. To be very honest, uh, because I was asked to be a part of this panel, I actually Googled. Google is my best friend, right? So when I Googled about STEM program, I was, to my surprise, there are many, many opportunities provided by Navy, Army, DITRA, NGA. We just don't know. So we need to start engaging with the younger York workforce to let them know that there are these opportunities out there so that they don't start later when they go to college, but when they're in high school, junior high school and senior high school. And then the last letter M, as everyone stated, mentorship is very important. If I'm saying all the right things, it's because of Ms. Moran, because she's my mentor. If I'm saying all the wrong things, it's still her fault, right? <laughs> But mentorship is very important because, as Claire stated, many people bring a lot of different perspective to, to many different areas that we could think about. We can collaborate, we can learn from each other. Mentors can also lead you and guide you into that direction where you can have job satisfaction. 
because I can tell you that we, I have an intern who just graduated from college and he started to work for us. And we asked the question yesterday, you know, how do you want your job to be? And the first thing he said was, I want my job to be fun, F-U-N. Mm -hmm. It's a challenge when we try to make our job fun, but I think there's a way to make that job fun. If the person, if the employee's not happy in terms of what they're doing, then a good mentor will find another job opportunity where he may be having fun. So mentors are very important in terms of setting your path to that success so that you can become an influential and contributor to what we do within DOD. I talk about DOD because I have a, no one from my family ha wears uniform. Yet, um, from family of six kids, three of us work for government. Two of my sisters work for Navy. I started out working for Navy, now I'm joint, I'm wearing purple. But when I was in Korea, and I, I would attend the first signal, command, uh, first signal Brigade change of command, I, I, sometimes I come to tears because of what DOD has to offer. DOD is the, that one entity that I know will provide that national security for me as well as my kids. So it's very important to me to talk about how we can make DOD an organization that can lead and advance cutting edge technology like we did years ago. However, we do know that we have a dimin diminishing uh, funding budget even within DOD. So we need to partner with academia, like with Jody. We need to partner with industry, such as a lot of the vendors that are providing, you know, many of the services to us. It takes the partnership. And what I told my son was that, I told my son, I told him, and I have to be very honest, I told him, do not work for government. <laughs> and the reason that I told them, him that was, do not work for the government from as an entry engineer. I told him, go and work within the private sector. Let them train you, let them make you an SME. And then once you have matured, then come back. Come to the government and start contributing. Because I feel like we as the government within DOD, that we have maybe, we have not done a great job in terms of motivating a lot of our smart guys because we're, we're not able to do a lot of those innovative technology development. But I believe that we can go out to the private sector, have my son become a real good engineer, cybersecurity engineer, and then come back to the government and start contributing. Now, I also told him to go and work for private sector because then he can give me some allowance money. <laughs> but, uh, but anyways, I think I'm a, a great product of what DOD had to offer to me from education perspective, as well as job opportunities, as well as maturity within the professional environment. The role that education plays is huge, but my understanding and my belief is that we need to start that early. We need to start having, uh, giving opportunities to the young, younger workforce so that they can start experiencing by allowing them to have intern positions, going to the summer camps. And you know, again, it's a great privilege for me to be part of this great panel because I'm still learning a lot from these people. But I think we have a great opportunity as, as women also to influence um, our younger, younger workforce to be part of the, the great <laughs> cutting edge technology development and capability delivery workforce for the DOD. Thank you. Thank you very much. So thank you, panelists. What I'd like to do now is I'm going to ask a couple of questions because I figure that can, if you're, it's towards the end of the day, you might be a little jet lagged or over food lagged um, and ready could, to ask questions. If you do, it's easier to go to the mic. This is the biggest room that, that we had because this was the only room that was available. So. Then I'm going to try to have some questions that are gender neutral as well as, as talking about women. So the first one is if you could tell a young woman what's the most important thing for her to do, what is that? And is that different than what you would tell a young man? So I'll, I'll go first. Um, so 
I would tell her to follow her dreams and her passion. And if you didn't choose right in school, and a lot of people don't, they, like me, she started one direction and then went a different direction, it's never too late to change. And I would tell, I mean, I would tell a man that too, but I mean, that would be one of the things I would tell people is there are on the job training programs, there are, you can go back into intern programs, there are lots of things you can do to retool if you're not happy in your job and you're not having, and so the, the whole fun thing was, we were talking about this yesterday. When I started, a job wasn't supposed to be fun. A job was a job. I mean, if you enjoyed it, that was really a bonus. And if the boss ignored you, that meant you were doing a really good job. Um, so fun was never really something I thought about with going to work. It was about satisfaction and growth. But I was always felt like I was contributing, and that was what was important to me. And I think that that becomes really what the advice I would give people is if if you're not happy where you are and you're not feeling like you're contributing and growing, because for me that's how you you do more and better and have fun is by growing, then it's time to change. And a change is, is never a bad thing if you do it for the right reasons. A change to run away from something is not a good thing, but a change to run towards something that's going to make you be more satisfied and grow is, is huge. And don't ever be afraid to change. So um, actually, to follow on to your advice, that was excellent advice. Um, for me, it's also never be afraid to make mistakes. Because it's never a mistake. It's a learning opportunity. It's a glass half full, half empty. To me, it's always half full, which drives my husband crazy. Uh, because I'm always the eternal optimist. And I think that's what we need to be. Um, to, to have the strength and belief in ourselves and the courage and the confidence to, one, admit when you're wrong um, and learn from it and move on. Uh, there is, to me, there is never an, uh, a wrong answer. There are just better answers, maybe. Um, and so, and, and the other thing is be persistent. Um, a lot of times, it just takes a lot of effort energy and again not be afraid to fail because a lot of times personally I would I would early in my career I would just hold back because I didn't want to be wrong but when I looked around me everybody else was wrong too so we're all in this together we all learn um, and to me the faster you fail the faster you can move on right so <laughs> always just have that faith in yourself and, and go for it and again um, and I think for women, a little bit more so, you need to, one, surround yourself with other women role models. Um, and, and for the men, make sure you listen to the women. <laughs> that one's gonna be hard to follow. <laughs> So for me, I mean, I, I just go back to the self-study. I think you've got to become the SME on whatever it is that you're responsible for. And it's, it's a lot easier to project confidence when you know what you're talking about. So mm -hmm. figure out what it is you're supposed to be doing and become the expert at it and become the go-to person and become the person that when they think, you know, cybersecurity, I'm going to that person because she always knows what she's talking about and she doesn't just... She doesn't just talk endlessly about nothing. So to go to, go to Seinfeld, yeah. <laughs> another Seinfeld yeah. reference. But so that's that's my advice: be the smartest person in the room. Oh, you go. So for me, um, never settle for less. There's always something better. So strive high because um, you can actually obtain. Because. I never really um, thought that I would become, you know, a division chief. I always strived for my best, and then promotion came because of that. It wasn't because I was looking for promotion. If you're doing what you can do and strive for higher, then you will um, take up that ladder as a, a side benefit. Um, if I was to give an advice to a woman, I would say, I would repeat something that, um, this uh, SCS, who is actually retiring today, Mr. Soans told me, and at that time, 
I didn't know who he was. But after I gave a, a presentation, um, he came to me and he said, hey, good, great job. And then one thing that he said, which surprised me, was he said, do not let testosterone intimidate you. <laughs> and I, wasn't, I was trying to figure out what he meant by that. Time to time, you know, we, we females, when we're in a room filled with, you know, all men, sometimes we do get intimidated. And sometimes I would have my own conversation with Mr. Soans in my head so that I do not get intimidated. So, you know, females, I think we need to keep our head high, keep our confidence, and do not be intimidated by gender. As Claire stated, if you're becoming that SME, then they will respect you because of what you know, not because of your gender. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So if you could share your thoughts as to how we should develop a cyber workforce. And I heard something today in one of our conversations and it said, I said, well, we should start in elementary school. And somebody said, no, you start it when they're four or five. No, start as soon as the device gets in their hands. So for those of you with kids, nieces and nephews, grandkids, it's what, as early as two, maybe even one when they pick up the phone, and parents' phone. But as soon as that device gets into the hand of a child through a higher level education, I originally wrote college, and because of some of the, the conversations we have, I'm not going to use that. I'm going to just say higher level, because that might be mm -hmm. a certification program of some sort. And then continuing, because we've heard about continuous education and self-education throughout the careers, and whether it's a career in just one area, you know, Jody's been in the academia field, probably pretty much her whole, and, and some of the, and, and the colonel's been with the Army for her career as an adult. Uh, some of us have been government, and Cindy has now ventured off into the commercial and industry world. So you've talked a little bit about it, but I'd like you to focus now how you do that as, as to build that cyber workforce when you could start with them when they first get this thing in their hands? It, so I don't know that it's, it's specifically a cyber workforce, especially when you're talking about a two-year-old. I think it's about good cyber hygiene. I mean, we live in this age where technology is part of our lives. It's what we do. Your pacemaker could be hacked into technically. I mean, there's so many things, but you talk to a, a tremendous amount of people and we've never taught good cyber hygiene. So you don't know, and it's what Mr. Halverson talked to, about at lunch. We don't delete the data. We don't go back behind ourselves. We don't tend to do that well. Some people do, but it's not, it's not cultural yet. And I think that's where you get the interest in being a cyber workforce. It's like, um, so I'll, I'll do a sexist example the other way. It's like, well, a little boy or a little girl. You see the local corner policeman, you want to become a cop or a, a first responder of any kind, fireman, policeman. I mean, that's ingrained in you from the time you're a little kid. Big red truck, fun something. Kids don't grow up to be 30 and say, you know, I think I want to be a fireman. It typically starts when you're little. And so good cyber hygiene and making sure that computers are cleaned up and that you teach, you teach children from the very beginning how to turn off the application, don't leave stuff open, don't put stuff out there that shouldn't be out there. I think you know, starting young, then just like the little kid who wants to become the fireman or the policeman or the chef in the local restaurant, whatever it is when you see it as a child and say, you know, I wanna be that when I grow up. I think that's really where we begin. And then the more you want to do that, then you refine it and you grow up and, and you do different aspects. But I do think it's just as fundamental as saying, you know, you can, you can drive that big red truck if you want to. You can be that cyber person and anybody could do that. So, so it would almost be like we, we teach a young child not to touch the stove because it's hot Correct. or do that. We should be thinking about how we do the same thing that said, oh, don't open that because you're going to bring all this bad stuff in. A I absolutely. I just don't. Th I mean, when you look at and again, I'll, I'll quote Mr. Halverson from lunch today. There is every single cyber incident you read about or that has happened is because of poor 
yeah. hygiene. People I, get yeah. in and take advantage. I yeah. can attest to that. All of our breaches at UH have been because of people. But anyway, uh, sidetrack. Um, so, um, and, and it goes to the, the kids, and I'm going to say kids because I'm old. Um, they are digital natives. They grew up with these things in their hand. They don't understand the risks involved with these things about posting too much information, about bullying online. Um, but the parents, us, our generation, we're digital immigrants. We don't necessarily know to teach the children what the risks are. So there comes in a role for schools, but how do we then ensure that the teachers or that the students will get this proper education in their academic career starting in preschool, in kindergarten, or when they touch those devices? Mm -hmm. and, and for us as professional technologists, uh, we need to intervene and step in and help that because we understand the risks and we know what can happen mm -hmm. if you don't secure your devices. And, and for those, future technologists who need clearances. You need to teach them what is respectable, acceptable behavior so they can get their clearances <coughs> when the time comes. Um, that was actually a problem that was highlighted in the Workforce uh, Development Council. Mm -hmm. They said that the students today, by the time they're in college, it's too late. They have done things that could damage their ability to get a clearance. So how do we mm -hmm. start very, very early on, um, but again, for the parents today who did not grow up with this technology, again, they don't understand the risks involved. So how do we help them and how do we help the schools and, and get that information down to our youth today? So um, that's my challenge to all of us here in this room. Mm -hmm. So mine, mine is a little different, but not so different. Um, so I, I just had this conversation with a colleague who's at the Army War College right now, and she was writing a paper on talent management and how to retain talent in cyber. And so she wrote this whole paper on things that the leadership needs to do to keep these kids in and how, what we're kind of doing wrong. And so when I read her paper, she said, what do you think? And I said, I said, well, I mean, if you look at it from their point of view, what they really want is don't make them paint rocks. I mean, and that's for some of the guys that, are, that have been in the Army and gals that have been in the Army a few days. I mean, there are <laughs> tasks you do that everybody does, everybody sucks it up, but it, it equates to painting rocks, and sometimes you wonder why you're painting them, and then somebody comes around the next week and you got to paint them black now. And they were white last week, now they're black. Next week they're orange, and it just seems like meaningless work. So the Army has, in the past couple of years, has really done a big restructure to accommodate cyber. We have new MOSs, which are fields, for enlisted officers and warrant officers. There's new schools, there's new education, they've gone out, they've talked to all the universities and all of the civilian training places that do certifications, and they're trying to figure out how to work these civilian training certifications into the Army school at the same time so that you graduate and you have these credentials that we require in order to be on the network. And then we provide all the training in the world, and then what happens? They walk right out the door because the guy sitting next to them is making twice their salary, doing the same job, and he doesn't have to paint rocks. So that person is doing the job that this person wants to do constantly. And I have, a, I have a former soldier that this happened to that's married to another soldier in our unit. And I just ran into him at, we did a trunk or treat last night, and I just ran into him and had this exact conversation with him, and he works at DISA now. And he doubled his salary, and he doesn't have to get up early anymore. He has a steady job, he can, be a dad, he can be a coach, and it's just not, so it's how do we create that in the Army? And I'll tell you, it's impossible, because there's so many other things that the Army gets pulled into, and you're trained for one thing, and then you turn around and you're doing a humanitarian mission the next. So it's, it's just, there's gotta be a way to, to recruit, train, 
and then insulate these people from some of, some of the things that we do to them. So I, I haven't solved that one. Um, I'll just leave that one to the next generation. <laughs> so so uh, what I have to say isn't very different from what was just said, but practically I think what we need to do is just like in public high school or any high school, K through 12, you have basic classes you have to take, English, math, social mm -hmm. studies. I think uh, cyber mm -hmm. should be one of those main curriculum that we start even pre-K. Because again, we talk about how they are holding you know, these devices in their hands. So you know, we as a, you know, from the government side of the house, I think it's true with any other DOD entity, but we have to take our annual security IA training. Sometimes we will like, why do we do this? But it does bring that awareness. So I think we really need to start with the education system where we have a cyber security classes or cyber awareness classes. Then on top of that, we need to start investing in some of these hands-on experiences even in high school. Mm -hmm. So as we stated, you know, there's robotic classes or clubs within some of the public school. There are a lot of the STEM summer camps that are available, and when I checked, it wasn't very expensive. So I think it's very important that we provide that knowledge base through uh, uh, you know, curriculum such as cyber class or computer classes in public school, but we need to start giving our um, young, younger workforce hands-on opportunities so that they understand how the systems work. As an example, my son was just a user of computer. He did not understand a thing about computer. He knows that computer is used to play video games. But now he's a cybersecurity guru. Once he went to college and he started to learn about all the hacking activities, the cybersecurity challenges, he started to be interested in that. But I think we need to start at younger age. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So curriculum is, I think, what we need to instill in our public school system. So I'm, I'm going to add something, and as, as you ladies were talking, one of the things that I, I had thought of was a Christmas gift that my husband and I got both our grandchildren, and at the time they were four and seven, was it's a Kiwi Crate, and there's a number of system, or companies, if you will, that are selling this where they do have a monthly package that shows up at the house and the kids put something together and what you talk about is continued involvement and some of them are pretty basic you know made a puppet one was the solar system and they got to put things together there's these individual monthly gifts that come and as stem related we've had some discussions for quite a while within AHEP the Hawaii Educational Foundation is robotics. Mm -hmm. And I think besides what you talk about with the cyber hygiene, mm -hmm. it's something that the kids can put their hands on where they see yep. how the cyber works and what they can do with it, and it's not hard mm -hmm. to get them to then figure out. I don't think we've done enough of that yet, so that's currently gonna be an area of opportunity. So I've asked my two questions to get conversation started. I'd like to open up to see if somebody has some questions that they'd like to, to ask the panel. There's behind this, the two tables here, there's a mic because otherwise we probably wouldn't hear you. Um, I know there's some loud voices in the room. I'm one of them, but I'm in front of a mic. So um, does anybody have any questions that they'd like to ask the panelist? Okay, I'm gonna ask one more. I know they're setting up the food and the beverages for the reception. And I'm gonna go back to um, a question. So you, what, can, what can we do to increase the opportunities for women at entry, mid-grade, and senior levels? So, um, so that's an interesting question because I don't know that we need to increase the opportunities for women, but we need to encourage women to take advantage of the opportunities that are there. So when I transferred from government to, to civilian, and it's been interesting listening to the other people on the, the board, I spent 30 years being the only woman in the room, and I was a technologist. 
and I was good at what I did, or at least I think I was, and, and I've moved into industry, and it's the same thing. I'm the only woman in the room. I sit on five different boards, government advisory and otherwise, and there's only one of those five, and there are two of us on that, that particular board. So I went from being in a government military situation where you're the only one there to industry, and it's the same thing at that level, but I asked to be there. Nobody reached out and tapped me on the shoulder and said, do you want to, I'm the one who applied, I'm the one who asked. I looked for opportunities and I took advantage of them. And I would say that women tend to, um, gets back to the, the imposter syndrome. I mean, you know you're qualified, you know you're capable, but you hesitate to put a spotlight on yourself to be that person who steps forward. I would encourage women to volu volunteer. Ask for that advancement. If you need more training, you can get it. There's nothing that you can't do if you set your mind to it and you want to. I keep, I keep handing you the mic, and you like that one. And I like this one. Yeah. <laughs> I like Claire. No, just joking. Um, so for me, um, you know, really it is uh, providing those opportunities for uh, women to know what is out there. Um, but additionally for me, being in the academic world, we actually have the ability to write grants. So uh, a couple opportunities coming up this, hopefully if we are awarded, um, our, if our proposal is funded by NSA, uh, the University of Hawaii has been hosting these things called Gen Cyber Camps, which is to introduce high school and middle school students to cybersecurity um, and computer science concepts one week in summer for free, so the students don't pay anything. Uh, but again, it is, is funded and sponsored through uh, a NS, NSA grant. And the other thing is Cyber Patriots. I know there's been a lot of Cyber mm -hmm. Patriot camps that went on this past summer uh, to, again, expose students to, um, I guess, defensive, uh, defense in cybersecurity terms about securing your computer and how to protect the environment in a, in a fun competitive way. So one of the other things we've been doing at the university is how do we create those sort of competitive fun environment similar to robotics but around cybersecurity. So um, in January, January 3rd, we're going to host a uh, high school cybersecurity competition for high school students. Um, so if you have people let me know and then we'll figure out a way to get the invites out. Um, and so again, we, we try to pursue these opportunities to be able to expose our youth to these opportunities. And as you said earlier with the Legos, the, the guys who are the ones doing all the building, well, let's help the women bit. Go, girls who code, mm -hmm. uh, code.org. Um, there's a new NSF grant that was awarded to UH Maui College to support high school teachers to teach computer science principles so that we can uh, help our teachers reach our students with computer science early on. So um, there are those opportunities. So if we have the ability to uh, approach, you know, uh, financial, let's see, donors to support our, our efforts, that would be greatly appreciated. And we actually have had um, uh, AFSIA, as well as um, the Public Schools Foundation of Hawaii, ISSA, they've all been great sponsors of our program. So um, again, and mentors, we always look for industry professionals to help us. So uh, again, providing those opportunities to our youth. So I agree with what Ms. Moran said with asking to be there. So when I started the Sisters in Arms program and in, at Fort Shafter, I had these magnets made up. And it said, they say, she needed a hero, so she became one. Because it was, all these women were asking me to start this program, and it turns out that all I do, honestly, all I do is I schedule the conference room, and I appoint <laughs> someone to run the next meeting. And they, they do everything. I mean, and they have it within themselves. And it's been, some of our junior NCOs have run these sessions. And they, I mean, they absolutely step up, but they need us to create that opportunity for them. So if you've ever, I mean, you walk up to any woman and you just say, have you ever heard this phrase? Or have you ever felt like saying this phrase? I just said that. I mean, and we all look at each other and we're like, oh yeah. 
So you have to look, you have to be aware of the younger women or the women that are not as bold and just, just watch for it. And if you, when you see it, you just turn and you say in a meeting and you're sitting there and one says it and somebody else steps on it and you say, well, as Jody said, and then you just back her up. I mean, especially if it's a good idea, it's easy to do, but it's just mm -hmm. something that we're not conscious of and we don't look for it. But when it happens to us, you know, after the meeting, you'll, you'll come out and somebody will say, did you see that? This just happened. And it's like, well, why didn't you do anything at the time? And mm -hmm. it's just, so you've got to look out for each other and back each other up. Okay, so my husband was a professor and he told me that a smart student is one who wait until last and summarize all the good answers, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> so um, as everyone stated, we need to let the, let, let, let the ladies know that there are opportunities out there. Then, as Claire stated, we need to create those opportunities by empowering them to take advantage of those opportunities. I think I summarized well, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> All right. So, what I heard today was, it, when we start talking about education, that we need to think about non-traditional pathways not just always a college degree all the way up. Um, there was some discussion, whether it was here today or a little bit earlier, that we need to change job descriptions mm -hmm. about certain jobs because if you do that, you're gonna get the people with certifications, not a four-year college degree. You have to align pathways all the way through school, through careers. Self-education and continuous education, whether that's formal schools like the Colonel went through or training program and certifications and just a, a class and training that you keep taking. Technology moves fast. That's no uh, news to anybody in this room. Mentors and get mentors that are different than you. That's important to do that. Build your network, how to contribute. And that I think is real key and that didn't come out but it's something that I struggled with when I was working was to how to retain people and said, if they want money, they're gonna leave anyways. But one of the things that I believe both the military and the government can do is, get, is put them in charge of things, make them a team leader, make them a project leader. And that can help lead to that sense of contribution and sense of accomplishment. Um, encourage, we heard that word a lot today Make jobs enjoyable. You know, you want to go to work. You want to feel like you accomplished something. You want to feel like you contribute. There's those words again. And the one that I really liked was where you, a number of you talked about a path where you move between government and industry. And I would act, add academia in there, whether you work in academia or you're getting education. So overall, I'm very happy because it accomplished what what I had, had hoped would happen with the panel when uh, we set this up. Two, I would thank everybody that came and, and spent the, the afternoon with us. Three, I do want to thank the panelists. They know that a donation has been made in their name by AFSIA International to Girls Who Code. I want to thank our sponsors, Sienna and Walker and Associates. And I want to thank FCA International, the Women in FCA Group, and the FCA International Leadership who reached out to that. There will be a reception that's going to happen in the back of the room. Don't forget to put your business card in, in the fishbowl so you can win a pair of Nike shoes. And enjoy the rest of the day and the rest of the conference. Thank you. Mahalo. Best if we, really be best if we, really be best if we, really be best if we.